Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Scott Harris from Public Health. We appreciate you joining this news conference. Uh, we, we wanted to just take a little bit of time just to give you a situational update. Uh, we, we don't have any uh, dramatic news stories for you today, but we wanted to update you on the situation around the state. Uh, we also have gotten many questions uh, about what's going on with the coronavirus response, and so we wanted to use this opportunity to uh, address as many of those questions as possible. We've taken questions from, from many of you, and we'll try to uh, answer as many as we have time for. We hope that this update will be something that we can do regularly, maybe a couple times a week or more if the situation uh, necessitates that. So let me begin by uh, letting you know that we currently have a total of 167 cases that have been confirmed in our state so far. Uh, these are over uh, 21 counties. Uh, fortunately, Alabama has not seen any deaths uh, so far. Um, a full half of those cases are located in Jefferson County. Uh, the, uh, the counties with the second highest totals actually are Shelby County, Lee County, and Madison County, each with 17 cases and a total of 167 cases. Uh, we uh, have an, an age range and those who've tested positive from as young as two years of age to as old as 97 years of age. Um, about 53% of those are male. Uh, we're still collecting information on hospitalization, uh, but around six to seven, six or seven percent uh, of those cases uh, have been hospitalized. We certainly have uh, information about uh, patients who are on ventilators in ICUs in uh, more than one facility in the state as well. Uh, we have recently begun posting these numbers twice a day on our website and would encourage everyone to check uh, alabamapublichealth.com for that. Uh, we are also posting totals of numbers that we have tested. Uh, we include the numbers that we uh, test here in our uh, state lab in Montgomery. We are also collecting information from uh, private labs who do testing as well. Testing continues to be a concern for us. We have met with a number of groups who are able to provide additional capacity for testing in our site at academic and other uh, commercial uh, organizations. We are gradually increasing those numbers, which will increase the total amount of tests that we can perform. Uh, one of our uh, continuing problems is locating collection specimen specimen collection kits. These are the swabs and the transport tubes that are used at the collection sites when a person has the no, their nose swabbed or, or uh, mouth swabbed. Uh, these are, are being uh, sought by every state in the country. Uh, as you know, the states uh, have been told that we are on our own in terms of, of finding this equipment, and so everyone is competing with each other, trying to find sources that can provide that, that, uh, those materials. The uh, governor's office has been extraordinarily helpful in putting together a group that, that is seeking to source those as well. We are routing our requests through the emergency management agency and are using their uh, contacts and their expertise to try to bring these to Alabama. Uh, so far, the, the lack of these uh, screening materials uh, like swabs have been the rate limiting step in uh, terms of setting up the screening sites we have around the state. Uh, still at this time, we have, uh, I think, 17 screening sites set up as of today. Um, those are the ones that are uh, connected to public health and the uh, Alabama Hospital Association. Uh, we hope to have 25 sites fully functional by the end of the week. There are certainly others that are, are uh, popping up associated with individual uh, institutions as well. Uh, and so, so there, are, there are some in several other counties besides those that I mentioned. Uh, we know that two sites opened in Mobile County today. This was one of the counties that we had targeted uh, as not having enough screening. Uh, there is a new site in Jefferson County uh, today as well, as well as others. We continue to uh, remind the public that we do not need to test you if you do not have symptoms. This is extremely important. We have many people who uh, want to be tested uh, because they're concerned about being exposed or because they're wondering if they could have contracted something in the community. Uh, people who are not having symptoms do not need to be screened. There's no indication for that. Uh, it certainly uses up a lot of very valuable supplies. It makes it much more difficult to test for us to test those patients who are uh, sick or in some cases acutely ill or hospitalized, uh, it slows down the return uh, on those test results for everyone. So please remember if you think you might need to be screened, please uh, pick up the phone, call your doctor, um, call the, the toll free number that we provided for you before and we'll send out again today to get more information about being screened. It, it's very important that if you're not symptomatic that you do not uh, attempt to be uh, screened. We are going to issue additional guidance to uh, health care providers in the state about who we would like to screen. Um, initially, we uh, 
if you remember uh, almost three weeks ago, we had screened only in accordance with CDC uh, criteria and it became clear that there was much more need for testing than that would allow. So we uh, made testing available to any provider who wanted to request it for any patient. Uh, we still believe in trusting the uh, provider's judgment and yet we want to make sure that they're screening those patients a little more carefully before they submit test results. We're going to discuss that with our provider groups and consider uh, issuing more guidance on that tomorrow. Uh, but generally speaking, we would like to test people who have symptoms and are either hospitalized, who are immunocompromised, or have other uh, health conditions, who are over age 65, who are health care workers, who are in a long-term health care facility, and, and other, uh, other types of uh, patients can be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. But generally speaking, we only want those symptomatic patients that meet these high-risk criteria. Now, for, if patients need to be tested who don't meet those criteria, there are certainly other uh, available testing uh, pathways. There are commercial labs that are still available uh, to clinicians who need to test patients who don't, uh, who don't meet those criteria. But we're trying very hard to preserve our testing capacity for those people who most need it. Uh, you may remember last Thursday we issued health orders uh, for the entire state related to the size of gatherings uh, as well as uh, guidance uh, around um, certain so social distancing uh, requirements. Uh, th there have been additional health orders that were issued over the weekend uh, in Jefferson County. Uh, that Jefferson County has the highest number of cases, as you know. It's not clear if that's because there's just more testing available there or if there's more um, if there's actually more disease there. Uh, at this time, we don't have additional health orders that we're uh, issuing at this time, but we continue to want to reinforce uh, the uh, the orders that we have put out related to social distancing uh, as well as the other items that we uh, discussed with you last week. So um, I have a handful of questions that were submitted. I'm just going to run down the list and answer uh, a few of them. We, we do have some of you here in the room today. We appreciate your proper social distancing today and we'll be glad to take live questions from all of you uh, in just a minute. Um, one question that, that's come up more than once uh, is related to blood donations uh, in view of COVID-19. Uh, at this time, there's no reason to avoid blood donation uh, to the best of our knowledge. We do not have guidance that suggests that the disease is transmitted that way or is an issue. Uh, so we would remind people that blood donation is still very important. Uh, our blood supply at any given time is, is a fairly fragile because it re, uh, relies on volunteers. There's no substitute for blood uh, in many cases. Uh, and blood is a perishable product. And when people stop donating for any length of time, the supply dries up really quickly because there's always such a demand for blood. So uh, we do not have any additional guidance about blood donations and would encourage people to still continue to do that. We get a number of questions about the site of screening tests, uh, screening uh, locations uh, in different counties around the state. As I mentioned, we had at least 17 of those today, as well as the other uh, pop-up sites uh, that we may or may not always know about. Um, we do not have the actual addresses of those on our website because there's some variability about when they may be open, what hours they may be open. In some cases, they may actually be mobile and might be at a different address. Uh, you can, however, obtain that information if your provider uh, needs needs to have you screen simply by uh, calling the, the number that the provider uses to arrange screening. So we can get that information for you with a phone call, uh, but we simply don't have it posted because it is changing uh, fairly rapidly and sometimes more than one time in a single day. We received a question um, about uh, sewing mask or other uh, masks that aren't uh, the, the N95 respirator mask and, and how effective those are. There is absolutely no recommendation to use those for healthcare providers. They are not considered effective and we would not recommend you using those. There is also no reason for, for healthy people to use those. There's no reason to think that they will protect you uh, from a case w of COVID-19, which can be uh, transmitted uh, through the airborne route. Uh, only N95 respirators are effective for preventing the, uh, that from a uh, preventing infection through an airborne route. Um, there are some uh, uses of these types of masks in a person who's known to be infected and who's coughing. If that person is being transported or is in public, uh, then a, a mask will protect against uh, a splashes, against droplets. And so that mask can be used on a person who's known to have an infection. But otherwise, uh, in spite of all the pictures you see all over the world of people using these masks, uh, there's no evidence that those are effective and we would not recommend that, that people use them. Um, let's see. 
Finally, I would say we do get a number of questions about um, hospitalized patients and how many they are. We, we have a way of sort of picking that up on, on the back end after doing our investigation. Uh, it looks like around 6 or 7 percent of our patients have been hospitalized, but we're still working to improve those numbers. We have some uh, electronic methods of uh, gathering data from hospitals that we're, we have been putting into place, and so we hope that we will have uh, more up-to-date numbers for you uh, soon. Uh, there's certainly not a ventilator shortage at this time, but we are con very concerned about the number of cases that hospitals have, uh, even without an absolute number shortage. Uh, some hospitals are already nearing capacity, and we've had to uh, coordinate uh, hospitals within the state so that they can share resources as needed. We also have uh, a group that is looking for the possibility of additional ventilators that could uh, come from out of state to uh, add to our current supply. So while we do not have a shortage at this time, there are some facilities that uh, feel a little pressed right now and we're doing our best to work with the hospital association to to address that so those were most of the uh, I covered the majority I think of the submitted questions uh, and that's all the prepared comments I have but be happy to take uh, questions from those of you here in the room uh, we heard from Mayor Walt Maddox over the weekend who said 528 tests were spoiled or insufficient um, do you know how many other samples across the state have been deemed spoiled or insufficient, and can you explain how that ends up happening? Sure. Um, I, I don't know the exact number, but I know that, that that's not the only only group. Um, that's certainly the largest group by far that were, that were unsatisfactory. Uh, when specimens are submitted to the laboratory, they have to be collected and preserved and transported in a certain way so that the specimen remains viable. Uh, in the case of, of the, the Tuscaloosa specimens, the, the main problem had to do with refrigeration or lack of refrigeration. Um, those, those specimens were not stored and transported uh, in a refrigerated environment and it just made it um, unsatisfactory for testing. The results wouldn't have been uh, valid had, had we run those samples. And so it was very unfortunate. You know, this is is a new test for everyone. We, we put out guidance to everyone uh, on how to do this, and for, for whatever reason, those just weren't transported in the right way. So uh, we certainly hope that, um, that people understand how, we, how they need to be done so that we can test them. Said some other groups that has happened as well. I mean, is this thousands combined that we could see um, in that? that no, I, I, don't, I don't think thousands. I, I, think, I think any other group would have been less than, than that in total. But, um, there, you know, in any given uh, submission, sometimes they're just not handled properly. You know, occasionally there can just be a reason that it's unsatisfactory because of, of other reasons too. Maybe it's not labeled appropriately and we don't know which patient it belonged to. Um, occasionally it's just, uh, you know, they're just issues with any type of process, I guess. But the, the main issue had been that one particular batch and they just weren't refrigerated appropriately. What? So going off of that question, would those people need to then be retested? Yeah, we, we don't have any data to report on those people. So if their clinicians feel that they need to be retested, then, then they would have to submit another sample. Also, you talked about at the beginning of your remarks, you said the state is increasing testing screening sites. Uh, do you think the reason we're not seeing high numbers in some counties is because of the lack of testing opportunities? Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. Um, there's no question that the, the sites with the most testing capability are the more populated counties, but also the counties that have the most screening that's going on. So um, we, we certainly understand that even though we have a system in which we try to be available to any person in any county and arrange testing, there's still a barrier for people in smaller counties, people who may have to travel to a site. Uh, rural counties simply have less resources in many cases or may be more difficult for someone to connect with a provider. So we absolutely recognize those barriers and are trying to, to, to work around them and arrange our screening sites so that we can serve everyone. But, th but there's still a, a shortfall that exists there. What's the current testing backlog right now? How many tests are, are waiting to be processed right now? Uh, the, the, the question is how many tests are waiting to be uh, processed. I, I, don't, I don't know the number. I would say that uh, we we're, are still telling people, you know, approximately 72-hour turnaround. Um, so it, 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 it depends on a given day when they come in and how many are being run that day. But we generally are still trying to get things done in about 72 hours. We know the commercial labs um, are now reporting more than a week turnaround time for them. So that's the, the main reason that we're trying to find new uh, testing facilities that can take uh, that overflow. I have some people that are confused about there are so far 1,800 tests that have been completed. 
That does not include, is that for sure not include private companies? Because we have Highlands who reported that they did a thousand tests. So, I mean, so how, how many more tests maybe have been? Yeah, completed? right. So, right. So we, we collect information from labs that test Alabama residents and we, we get by the rule, the emergency rule we established a couple of weeks ago, we get all positive results and we also are supposed to get all tests uh, even if they are negative so we're confident we're receiving all positive results the number of negative tests that we're not getting uh, we think we are getting a lot of them uh, but at this time I, I think it's just been a, an issue with those labs being able to electronically report this is a, a test they haven't had to report to us before and it just takes a little bit of time to get them up to speed on that so I'm not positive we're capturing all the neg negative ones by far certainly that number would end indicate that we're not getting all of them. Can you talk about if there's any information that's being kept, tra any information that's tracking people that are getting better from the virus to just kind of let our viewers know that, you know, there is, I guess, hope instead of fear? Sure. So the question has to do with those who may be recovering. Um, I do not have specific data here in Alabama, although there is data available from other parts of the world. Um, remember, about 80 percent of people, or maybe maybe even higher, 85 percent in some in some cases of people who get infected do not have serious illness, and they tend to recover within a few days and probably have some degree of immunity. Although we don't know at this time if they have any long-lasting immunity, but they may have at least short-term immunity. We can hope that it will will be longer. Um, again, we believe most people would do well with this. Um, there, there's a little bit of concern about what we've seen in Italy recently. As you know, um, Italy has been hit particularly hard, and Italy has had more deaths than any country in the world at this time, even more than in China. Uh, and so in Italy, um, a full 40 percent of the people who went into the hospital actually were young adults and middle-aged people, although, again, deaths are still much more common in the, in the elderly population. But there is a, a group of, of younger people, younger and middle-aged people, who are having fairly significant disease. But, but when people recover, they seem to recover fully. You mentioned some numbers at the beginning of your remarks. You said that between the people are between the age range of 2 and 97 that are uh, that have the virus in Alabama and you also said the majority of them are males that's right that's correct yeah so the the numbers that I gave earlier it was about 53 percent male I think the age range uh, was about uh, age 2 to age 97 the, the median actually was about age 44 uh, and so uh, again it, it's not necessarily a, what we what you would consider a, a truly random distribution um, I'm not confident that that's actually accurate of all the cases in Alabama, given the relatively small numbers we have right now. Um, but certainly, um, we know young adults and, and middle-aged people do get infected. Uh, it, we may not see them as often. We may not pick them up as often if they're not having a severe disease. Uh, and, and obviously, the seniors are the ones that have the most severe disease. What would it take to issue a stay-at-home order? Um, at what point would the state consider that, and are we close? I know Jefferson County has a little bit more stricter guidelines right now, but what would it take for either the state or Jefferson County to issue a stay-at-home order? Yeah, the question has to do with it, with a stay-at-home order. Um, obviously, that's something that would have to be done uh, in, in conjunction with, with guidance from the governor's office in, in consultation with the legislature. Uh, we, we certainly have public health recommendations we can make it from time to time, and we have not made that recommendation at all. But it, it, public health orders obviously have, have a significant effect on people. It affects their lives. It affects their livelihoods. Um, it's very difficult to know in real time with the information you have if you're strict enough or if you're too strict or if you have it just right. And honestly, you know, time is going to tell us if we're right about that. Uh, but a, a stay-at-home order uh, would, uh, wouldn't be unilaterally issued by the health department, but only after consultation with a lot of others. In your professional opinion or the department's professional opinion, what I mean, how many cases would we need to have? What would that? What would the community outbreak have to look like to even issue a stay-at-home order for for any? Maybe not even on a statewide level, but on yeah, on a sure. The, the question is, how would a, how would a stay-at-home order? What criteria would be used? I, I don't think there's a specific trigger. I think we're monitoring the outbreak every day and looking at the the number of new cases, but also the rate at which we get new cases. Um, certainly, uh, some of the decisions that have been made uh, in California or or in New York have to do with um, outbreaks in healthcare institutions, for example, or exposure of really vulnerable populations. So I, I don't think there's a real clear criteria for that. There are just a lot of factors that would have to be taken into account. 
You mentioned earlier that um, there were testing sites that your office or this department may be unaware of. Why is that? Uh, it's because uh, some uh, hospitals, for example, may have their own uh, testing supplies. They may have their swabs and transport media. They may have uh, an arrangement with a private laboratory to do the testing. And we would eventually learn about those test results from the laboratory itself. Uh, but they, they don't need our uh, our authority or our permission to set those up. They're, they're you know, perfectly welcome to do those in their community. And we would encourage that. We, that increases the overall capacity uh, and allows more people to be tested. Can you speak about, the governor uh, tweeted out that someone anonymously donated um, mask and other personal protection equipment. Can you speak about that? Yeah, I, I don't, I'm aware of that as well. Um, I don't know all of the details of that. I, I would say that healthcare facilities in particular are really um, pushing hard to find personal protective equipment. So we're very grateful for, for whatever person or organization made that available. Um, we, we would certainly encourage those in, in the private sector who have access to that to think about donating that to your hospital to protect your healthcare providers. We know there's, there are certain non-medical industries that can use, for example, respirators uh, and uh, as a normal course of business. And if people have additional uh, supplies, we would encourage them to, to hook up with their local healthcare providers and hospital and consider making a donation. It, it is so vitally important to keep our healthcare capacity running uh, fully, and uh, we, we've seen in other countries like Italy, in particular, um, how infections among your healthcare staff can really devastate your ability to take care of people. Uh, we've gotten a lot of this, these questions to the newsroom. People saying they have to come to work, and there are hundreds of people in whatever plant manufacturing off a, a building. How can they make us work when this is going on? Yeah. Um, I, our, so the question has to do with people uh, in a work environment. We did not issue uh, health orders related to work environments. We were, we were speaking of social and recreational gatherings. However, that said, um, our, our guidance for workplaces is that they need to try to encourage social dis distancing as much as possible. Um, it's very important for people to stay six feet apart uh, if there's any way possible to do that. Uh, but our, uh, we do not have any uh, health orders related to work environments. So. When it comes to employees at those sorts of workplaces, if they feel that they're being placed in danger or something is wrong with that, is there a way for those people to report their businesses for not following guidelines when it comes to distancing? Yeah, I, I would say that um, guidelines are guidelines, and I would encourage them to, to start with those conversations there in the workplace and then use what other uh, uh, other avenues they may have when they have those those issues. Um, in, in some parts of the country and even in Jefferson County, there have been health orders uh, related to workplaces, but, but we have not adopted that statewide. Um, we've had a lot of people asking about daycares. Can you just give us a clarification? There are some daycares have emailed saying, um, you know, they're confused that all schools have been mandated to close, but then now daycares are allowed to stay open. So what's the recommendation here? Not send your kid to daycare if you can avoid it. Uh, maybe just clarify some of that. Sure. So the question has to do with, with daycares. Um, the, with, with daycares, we would prefer um, if people have the option to uh, keep kids uh, at home, if that's an option for them. Uh, I think any uh, time that you have people gathered together, there's a greater risk for disease transmission. Uh, th that said, we certainly understand that the reality that many people have of, of having to use daycare. So our health order that we uh, amended on Friday addressed the size of daycare to try to minimize the, the size of those classes as much as possible. Uh, you know, social distancing really probably probably isn't a practical suggestion in a daycare. Children aren't going to maintain uh, a six-foot distance from each other. I, I think that's really unlikely. And yet we would say that that's the ideal we would like people to strive for. It, it is very important to try to keep people apart, uh, even if, if daycares may be necessary for a lot of folks. Can you talk about why we haven't seen a lot of uh, cases in the Mobile, southeast Alabama area? I mean, you have a major international port there. You have cruise liners that are in and out. Also, people go there. You know, it's a big tourism attraction spot. 
Sure. So the question has to do with the, the relative lack of cases that have been diagnosed in uh, in Mobile. Um, I, I think getting their testing capacity uh, up to full speed is the reason we haven't seen cases. Uh, it, it's a uh, it's a big city and it has all the, the features you mentioned that would make us suspect that there are cases going on there. So I think as the testing capacity increases there, we likely will pick up more. Not likely, we definitely will pick up more cases there. In recent days, we've seen a growing number of state and federal lawmakers kind of questioning the effects of COVID-19 on communities. What would you say to these officials who are questioning whether the cure is worse than the disease? Uh, yeah, the, the question has to do with, with, I guess, the economic impact or maybe social impacts of, of health orders related to social distancing. Um, it, it's a very difficult balance. Um, I, I think all of us come at it from a different perspective. Uh, in public health, we are doing our very best to make recommendations to protect the health and safety of our state. That's our mission and that's our charge. And, and we have an organization that actually has a lot of great people who are very good at, at doing that. And at the same time, we understand that that's not, not the entire picture. It, it may be the most important thing, and yet it's not the only thing. And so uh, we do have to work very closely with other leaders in our state to make sure that we are seriously considering the impact of any health orders that we issue. We, we spend a lot of time um, really agonizing, to be honest, over these issues because they really do affect people, and, and we get that. Uh, and so time will tell if we overreacted or if we didn't act soon enough or if we were maybe got it right. Um, but, but we certainly understand other people's concerns about the economy. I think it's clear from what's happening in the world. This has a dramatic impact on the economy. Um, and what we hope to do is to break the transmission cycle and get this over as quickly as we can. I know I've asked you this before, and a lot of people are still wondering this, and I know there's no crystal ball, but a lot of people are just wondering, when will we get back to that point of normalcy? Um, you know, for a lot of people, this is uncomfortable um, in how they interact with their fellow human beings. Um, but are we looking at maybe extending this past that April 6th deadline, or are we moving closer to, um, I guess, ending it sooner? Yeah, the, the question has to do with what's our timeline. Um, our health orders, as you know, had a, an expiration date, if you will, of April 5th. But as we told you last week, we'll uh, evaluate each one of those orders uh, before that time and, and give uh, guidance to the, the governor and discuss with other folks and try to get input before we make a decision on, on whether to continue that. Um, I would say Alabamians um, ought, ought to be prepared that that might happen, that they might be extended. Um, but at this time, I think it's too early to say. Uh, it is hard on people. We are asking people to make a tremendous sacrifice, and social isolation is uh, is isolation. And, and as human beings, we don't like that very much. Uh, for people who are, aren't able to work right now, people in in the food service industry, for example, those people are really hurting, and we get that. And we want them to get back to their normal lives as soon as we possibly can. Uh, so, so we're trying to, to use all the available information that we can to see what the course of this epidemic is going to look like in Alabama, and then we can make our recommendations at the right time. I know you guys are constantly looking at this situation. I know it's constantly evolving, but at this point in time, how likely is it that schools will open up again April 6th? Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure about the decision on schools. I, I have a, a meeting actually with, with um, Dr. Mackey and the education folks uh, today, uh, this afternoon, where we'll go through all the different scenarios and try to make our best guess. Uh, at this time, we really are forecasting a little bit and just trying to see into the future and, and figure out where we're going to be. Uh, but that decision has not been made, and, and I'm not sure we'll be able to make it uh, right away. I think we'll wait a little closer to time to decide. So um, I've got uh, time for a couple more. Then. Dr. Ayers, when do you think, based on what you know, uh, we can expect to see the virus peak in Alabama, and does that depend on people actually staying at home and social distancing? Sure. The, the question is, when can we see this uh, peak? Uh, and, and the answer is, it, it really depends on what Alabamians do. Um, if Alabamians are willing to, to engage in social distancing, to uh, avoid groups of people, to stay home when they're sick, to do all those hygiene things that we talk about, we'll get through this uh, a lot sooner. Uh, rather than later. Even if we do have cases that continue for a long time at a, at a much lower rate, um, we'll actually be better off because that'll preserve our health care capacity. That'll preserve the ability of government to respond when responses are needed. Um, that will allow uh, less people to be sick at any one time. And there's just so many reasons that that's, uh, that that's a good thing. So uh, we'll get through this um, at some point. We know we will. 
uh, but the more people are able to cooperate with, with these uh, recommendations to engage in social distancing, uh, the better we'll be in the long run. Can you get coronavirus again once you've already had it? The question is, can they get reinfected? And the answer is, we don't know. Um, there are other coronaviruses that cause f common colds, for example, that people are able to get again. Uh, we do know that, but we just don't know about this one yet. So. Okay, go ahead. Last question. When it comes to nursing homes, healthcare facilities that receive uh, supplies and equipment deliveries, how can they kind of reduce the spread of infection or potential with COVID-19, uh, the virus, if they're delivering to these places that are already limiting visitation? Sure. So, so the question has to do with nursing homes and their ability to control infections with, with deliveries or with visitation or with their staff or, or whatever the case may be. Nursing homes actually do a really good job of, of handling infections. Um, infections are... are, are a threat for all, you know, congregate living facilities, uh, wh whether it's a nursing home or an assisted living facility, or you know, any t you know, a dormitory or a barracks or anywhere you have lots of people gathered. Nursing homes spend a lot of time uh, preparing for this and training their staff and trying to prevent this. And and there can occasionally be outbreaks in nursing homes of of certain illnesses like influenza. So. So this is a, not a new uh, drill for them, uh, and, and I think they've got a good plan in place and, and can, can handle that. All right, well, listen, thank you very much for joining us today. We just wanted to take an opportunity just to answer some questions from the public. Uh, we'll try to do this again at a frequency that uh, makes sense for you all. And thanks again for being here.